Hey guys, uh, I told you I was not interested in, in getting people to side with me on my view of what happens to the lost. I believe that they're destroyed. They perish, they suffer the second death, and I'll tell you why. Uh, I, I tried to explain it before, but everybody keeps coming out. No way, that's not biblical. You're denying scripture. No, I'm not. I'm actually taking the majority of scripture and standing on it. In addition, St. Paul, Clement of, what was it? Clement of something. Anyway, a couple of first century church fathers believed in the destruction of the wicked. This eternal torment thing didn't get popular until Greek philosophy infiltrated the early church. The Jews didn't believe in eternal torment either. They believed in the destruction of the wicked. So I'm looking, I went and, and spent over a year researching every verse about what happens to the dead, the wicked, the lost. And I found it in the Old Testament and the New Testament. There's only two or three verses that can kind of support eternal torment. But then I found verses in the Old Testament that are just like them that don't mean eternal torment. It means that their judgment will be a sign for all eternity to warn others. That's what it means. So they used artistic language. So please, before you start calling me names or saying I'm doing something unbiblical, it is okay for you to disagree with me. I am not interested in you to stop believing in eternal torment. If that's what you believe, I grew up believing that. But after a very long study of understanding how scripture was written, I came to the conclusion that the lost are destroyed. I do not believe in the immortality for lost people. I don't. It says the spirit returns to God who gave it. So the thing that is immortal returns to God, not us. So um, it clearly says that only those in Christ have eternal life. Death is death. It's not you're actually alive and conscious, but in torment. That's not what death means. And we have the scriptures say death is. So uh, I believe that God in his infinite wisdom is not unjust. Um, now, I don't know what happens to the fallen angels, the beast and the false prophet. Maybe they're immortal because they're angels. I believe they are. They may be tormented. But man lost immortality in the Garden of Eden. Of course, he lost it in his flesh. But I think there's no life for man outside of God. We were created to be his children. If you reject it, you're destroyed. I, I will give you many, 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 many verses about the destruction of the wicked, how their memory is no more. They perish. They're done. They're destroyed. Everlasting destruction. Everlasting punishment. Not punishing. Punishment. It's done. It's permanent. And then we see the same language used to describe destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Taking his vengeance and eternal fire on Sodom and Gomorrah. Is Sodom and Gomorrah still burning? It says that Sodom and Gomorrah is an example of what will happen to the lost. Okay, that's what happens. They're destroyed in all-consuming fire. The fire that's not quenched, it's an eternal fire, not a natural one. It's an eternal fire because it's an eternal source. Okay, it's not natural. So when we look at the language here, we have to let the Bible define it. And this immortality of man came in later with Plato and pagan ideas of the afterlife. It was not in scripture. But once Augustine, who was a student of Plato, brought it in, that started happening. I just, I don't believe that God torments forever. We're, ta we're talking a billion years, million years, a billion years. You know, I think that hell is eventually cast into the lake of fire. And I believe it's destroyed. Hell and death are swallowed up in victory. Death is destroyed. That's what I believe. It says it in scripture. And hell and death were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. See, we're told that those in Christ, they don't suffer the second death. The first death here on earth, physical perishing. 
The second death is Jesus defines it. Fear the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell or Gehenna, the lake of fire. So let's look. We're going to look at verses, okay? Because it's not right that people are saying this is not biblical and there's no way a, a destruction or well, not, they call it annihilation, but I'm not really an annihilationist. I believe that they're held in hell for an age, an age, a, a, a term, and then hell itself is destroyed in the lake of fire, and they're gone. And I'll show you the verses, why I believe it. First, I want to deal with the verse about the smoke of their torment rises forever. They have no rest day or night. All right, first of all, it's talking about those who take the mark of the beast. The no rest day or night is here on earth while they're still alive. Remember, they cry for death and death won't come. They, they, they're crying, oh, rocks fall on us, right? That's why they have no rest day or night. Now, the smoke of their torment rises forever. The same words are used to describe a city in the book of Isaiah that God judges. It's a ruinous heap. It's not that it's going to be burning for all of eternity. It means that its destruction, its everlasting destruction and desolation is an eyewitness to God's judgment for all time. That's all it means. Let's look at it. Okay. <clears throat> Isaiah 34, 10. It shall not be quenched night or day. The smoke thereof shall go up from forever. From generation to generation, it shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever. Do you see the apocalyptic language? It's not saying that the people in this city are tortured forever and ever in a fire. It's saying that God's eternal vengeance was on this wicked city. And because it'll lie in waste for all of eternity, it'll be a sign to others. Just like Sodom and Gomorrah. Is a bunch of pile of brimstone right now. It's a sign to us that God's judgment came on it. It's just saying it's always going to be a symbol of God's justice. All right. So it doesn't mean that the punishment goes on forever and ever. See, in scripture, God destroys his enemies. He's not cruel. And, and I don't see anywhere where human beings are immortal. It says only God is immortal. I showed this in other videos. Okay. So let's look at the verses. Now, this is not you to agree with me. Okay. This is my point is not to get you to agree with me. If you believe in eternal torment and you feel better with that. That's, that's fine. I can see where you get that in scripture. Absolutely. I'm not here to change your mind, but what I am doing is why don't we stop making absolute statements? I don't think we can really say. You can't say there's no way that scripture supports the destruction of the wicked. There's no way you could get anybody that comes to that conclusion is lost. Okay. Uh, no, not true. St. Paul didn't promote eternal torment. Uh, the early, some of the early fathers did not promote eternal torment. Um, so I, I think it's clear in scripture, the early Jews and rabbis, they don't believe in eternal torment based on the Old Testament. And I don't believe in it because I did a study for a year trying to understand there's only one or two verses that appear that the torment is forever and ever and ever. But once I realized, like the one in Isaiah, it's just figurative language. Then I went, oh, okay, all these verses about perishing, the second death. They'll be destroyed. <clears throat> Do you remember Satan's lie? You shall not surely die. He tells people you're going to be reincarnated. You just keep on living. You're immortal. I don't think it's true. That was the lie he told Adam and Eve. You shall not surely die. Uh, isn't this the same thing? You won't die. You'll just be tortured for all of eternity. What a way to get God to sound like a, a loving person. I, I just don't believe it's there. If it was true, if I was convinced it was true, I'd say, you know what? He's a just and holy God, and I believe him. And for years, I supported eternal torment because I was taught it, and I believe that's what it said in Scripture. But then I didn't see all the many, 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 many verses 
that were not supporting it. And so when it comes down to it, I've got to say, the Bible seems pretty clear on this to me. And so for somebody to say it's not in the Bible or anybody that comes to this conclusion is lost, that's horrible. Uh, have you done a, a study on this? Maybe. Because it's real easy to see why I come to this conclusion. And that's why I'm doing this video. So you can at least understand why I came to this. I prayed over it. I spent time in God's word for over a year. I really did study this. I believe it because it's what the word of God says. But again, I'm not here to convince you to change your mind. I'm just trying to get you to stop saying evil things about brothers and sisters in Christ who might not agree with you on that. It's not right to do that, especially if you haven't studied it clearly. All right, let's look at a few things. All right, John 3, 16 is one of the most famous verses in the world. For, and by the way, this is how the hound of heaven got me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish. But, have eternal life. So there's two sides there. One side is that they perish. The other side is that they live forever with Jesus. Okay, see, so you don't have immortality unless you have Christ because he is the way, the truth, and the life. Immortality and torment is still immortality. Immortality is given to us through Jesus. He restored it through his suffering on the cross. Adam lost it. The second Adam got it back. But if you're not in Christ, you don't have that immortality you perish, all right? It says, this is the most quoted verse in the Bible, one of the clearest accounts of the destruction of the wicked. Destruction of the wicked. Whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. He, John did not write, whosoever believes in him shall not, shall not have everlasting life in torment. We'd have to change John 3.16 to they shall not have torment forever and ever and be tortured or tormented forever and ever, but have everlasting life. Or they shall not have everlasting life in torment, but they'll have everlasting life in joy. It would have to say something like that. It says they perish. Jesus said to fear the one who destroys both body and soul in hell. It says it in scripture. Destro fear him who can destroy all of it all right let's see uh it says the wicked will not have immortality at all immortality is reserved through the gospel second timothy 1 10 only those in christ have everlasting life not the wicked. the wicked don't have everlasting life in torment that see th i just want you to see why I came to this conclusion and it's from the Bible. It's not, it's not church. It's not tradition. It's not what it's been shoved down my throat for 50 years. It's because I spent a year on this doctrine, looking at every verse I could find on it in the, in the old Testament. People ignore the old Testament when it comes to this. That's how I found the verse about the smoke of their torment rising, realizing he was talking about another city he had destroyed. They're not still burning. So when I did this study, please refrain from saying, oh, uh, annihilation is no way supported in scripture. There's no, there's like 50 verses. I'm going to give you some more of them. Okay. It's common sense that I would come to this conclusion. It doesn't mean I'm lost just because I have a different understanding than you. I think it's clear. But again, it took a lot of time for me to leap to this position. And it's why I didn't want to promote it to others. Because I wanted them to hear the gospel. I knew this would probably scare them into thinking that they were, I was weird or something. Because I believe something different. I think it's wrong to make these absolute statements. But at least my brothers and sisters will understand why. All right, so here's a few more, okay? Uh, the word perish, he said in the Greek, is apolumi. It is correctly translated many other times as destroy or destroyed. So the lost are destroyed. In Matthew 10, 28, he says the body and soul will be destroyed in hell. It says that, or Gehenna, the lake of fire. See, because I told you, hell itself. 
and hell and death were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So I believe they are held somewhere till judgment and then they're cast into the lake of fire. Done. Destroyed. And I'll give you the verses on that. Okay? It doesn't mean they're not tormented and the wicked may have worse torment than others do. I just don't believe it lasts for all eternity because they don't live forever. Because the Bible says that man is not immortal. All right. I don't believe that. So, all right. So, um, here's some more verses about destruction. Psalm 92, seven shall be destroyed forever. Please write these verses down. Psalm 92, seven shall be destroyed forever. All right. Psalm 1, 6, be the way by the way of the ungodly shall perish. Matthew 10, 28, rather fear him, which is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. John 3, 16, whosoever believeth in him shall not perish. James 4, this is James 4, 12. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. All right. Second Thessalonians who shall be punished with everlasting destruction. It means they will never live again. Destruction. Destroyed. Philippians 3.19 says, Whose end is destruction. They're destroyed. All the wicked people, they are destroyed. James says they're destroyed. Philippians says, Paul says they're destroyed. In several books, Paul says the wicked are destroyed. Okay? Hebrews uh, 10.39. But we are not of them who draw back into perdition. You know what perdition is? Destruction. We are not those who draw back into destruction, but of them to the believing of the saving of the soul. All right? See, our soul is saved and we live forever with the Lord. Their soul is lost and it is destroyed, both body and soul, in hell. That's what it is. That's why I came to this conclusion. Again, I'm not trying to get you to believe it. Believe what you want. I'm trying to get people to stop calling me names and saying it's not possible to read the Bible and come to this conclusion. Because the reason I changed my mind was on the scriptures alone. I said, I'm taking all a man's tradition. And I don't see it here, especially when I understood those artistic and metaphoric verses, like the smoke of their torment. It's clearly an artistic way of saying that they're going to be an example for others for all time. That's all it means. It's not saying that they're tortured for all of eternity. Can you imagine how long that, I mean, for a billion years, you're still, it just doesn't even make sense. All right. Revelations 20, 14 says, this is the second death. That's the verse I gave you. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Now, is God intentionally trying to deceive us by using words that have a different meaning than what their plain meaning is? Do you see? I don't think God's an author of confusion. However, I think that he's poetic and sometimes he uses verses that are uh, metaphoric. And so, but if you've got 50 verses like what I'm giving you here and one or two like that, I think he figures you're going to figure it out because you got all these verses saying the wicked are destroyed, they're consumed, they perish, they suffer the second death and not go with the two or three verses that sound eternal. But that's not what happened because the pagan ideas of the immortality of man came into the early church. But it's not what Paul preached. And it's not what, what is it, Clement? I had a couple of people that believed in the destruction of the wicked in the, in the first century. And I can't find the list now. All right. Let's see. Is It says, is God intentionally, these are my notes. Uh, one of my viewers wrote me too and said that God's not trying to deceive us by using language of utter destruction. And I don't think so either. I think God says what he means. Uh, let me see the notes here. Isn't this what their plain meaning is? The literal meaning is the first meaning used unless context declares otherwise. I agree. And the context declared otherwise in Isaiah 34 10. 
the smoke of their torment. Oh, it means a destruction, that they're going to be an example forever. It doesn't mean uh, uh, eternal torment of a person that they live forever without Christ. All right, it says, again, William West summarizes this point viewed beautifully when he states, the present definition of words must be destroyed and new definitions given. If eternal torment's true, then the verses I just gave you, and there's many more, by the way, I mean tons of everlasting destruction, second death, perish. It's all over scripture. I can't even name them all, okay? And we've got to redefine every one of the places that say second death, perish, destruction, and everlasting punishment. Not punishing torment, but permanent, all right? Destruction. They lay waste. They're gone. The memory is gone forever. You've got to redefine words in order to make eternal torment work. Did God use words in a way other than how we understand them? That, no, it, it's clear. Death is no longer death. It's eternal life in torment. That's what it's been turned into. That death isn't death anymore. It's now eternal life in torment. So you can't have eternal life without Christ. It's just not pleasant. So if you see what I'm saying, I'm a person that likes to use common sense. And when I see all these verses, after a year of study, I was like, I have no choice. I don't see Paul preaching eternal torment. I don't, I don't see any of this. I see Jesus warning about the destruction of the body and the soul. I think God says what he means. It means what he says. So I'm going to go with they're destroyed. All right. So to me, it's clear. The present definition of words must be destroyed and new definitions given. Again, the new net definitions end up being the opposite of the old definition. As in death is no longer death. It is eternal life, but in torment. No other book in the world uses these words this way. Did God use words in a way that would be a deliberate misleading of mankind? They are not used with these meanings in our everyday language. When we say anything, a plant, an animal, or a person is dead, we do not mean that that plant, animal, or person is alive and being tormented. We believe they're actually physically dead, right? So to give it another meaning, death and destruction must be made to mean one thing when it's a plant or an animal, and then another thing when it's man then. We've got to redefine everything. Death, to me, is death. I, I don't see the Bible redefining death. I don't. And so I come to the conclusion that Paris, destruction, body and soul, Jesus cleared up for me. Yes, there is something that leaves this body and is sent somewhere. That is also destroyed without Christ. They're going to stand at judgment. I believe they're held in hell or Hades, Sheol, the dwelling of the dead. And then on the day of judgment, they're destroyed. They're cast in a lake of fire. I do not believe they suffer for all of eternity. All right. Uh, it says, my mind fails to conceive the grosser misinterpretation of language. When the five or six, six strongest words destroy and destruction are explained to mean everlasting life, but in torment. Destruction's destruction. Those who wrongly believe in immortality for all from birth must reinterpret the Bible to say this. Those who are destroyed are not destroyed. In James 4.12, 4, look these up, people. 2 Peter 2.12, 2 Peter 3.7. So when it says they're destroyed, they're not really destroyed. Okay, we have to redefine that. Those who perish, they really don't perish. 1 Corinthians 1.8, John 3.16. Those who die, they really don't die. Romans 6, 23. Those who are consumed are not consumed. Hebrews 10, 27. We're warned of that fiery indignation, aren't we? The end of the wicked is really not their end. Philippians 3, 19. Hebrews 6, 8. Really not their end now. We got to redefine all. If eternal torment's true, we've got to redefine Every one of these verses. Mortals are actually born immortal. 1 Timothy 6.16. Therefore, can any such thing uh, as being mortal. There's nothing mortal in it. Everything's immortal. But it says God, only God is immortal. All right? 
And then people go, oh, well, that's just talking about the body. No, I don't think any part of man is immortal without the Lord. See, I think the spirit belongs to the Lord and the body and soul is destroyed. Fear the one that can destroy both body and soul. And so I think that is held in Hades until the judgment day. And then it is cast into the lake of fire and destroyed. And yes, I believe that the wicked perish and that some suffer more than others. Greater damnation. Absolutely, I believe that. The second death is not really a death, but it is eternal life in torment. So, if, if you keep saying that uh, the destruction of the wicked is not a biblical concept, I would ask you to spend more time in the Bible. Because there's only two or three verses you can kind of use to support eternal torment. But when you look and compare them to other verses that say the same thing, they're not really saying that. So, uh, again, not trying to change your mind, just trying to get you to see how I got there. Okay? So, because all this calling people names and claiming annihilation is not supported in Scripture. You have a very unbiblical view. No, I don't. Everything I believe comes from the scriptures. Everything. Every belief I have comes from the Bible itself. So I, I'm asking you to please stop calling people names that have come to a different conclusion. It, I didn't come to this easily. And I studied it and contemplated it and prayed over it for many, many months before I changed my position. And I still didn't promote it. Because it, it wasn't important to me what people believe. All that, all that I care about is that people understand that they never have to go to hell because of what Christ has done. And that either way, if you believe in eternal torment or you're held in hell for a while and then utterly destroyed or perish or suffer the second death, that it's all horrible because you got to stand before the Lord and hear him say, I never knew you. What horrific idea in our head. Nobody. Needs to hear that. And that's why I preach the gospel. So please, people, let us have uh, at least some understanding that there is two biblical positions on the destruction of the wicked. It's just that eternal torment got popular with the Catholic Church and the pagan infiltration of the immortality of man. I don't believe it. I think it's clear in scripture. But. I understand those that do. And I'm not going to mock you for believing what you believe and say you're lost. I don't believe you're lost if you believe in eternal torment. You're my brothers and sisters in Christ. And you shouldn't say I'm lost because I come to another conclusion based on scripture. I could see if I was going to the new age people and, and getting a uh, spirit channeling to my head. I'm not. I, I'm reading the Bible and coming to this conclusion. Okay, guys. God bless you. Bye.